Monsieur le directeur de Paris School of Economics, euh, permettez-moi de vous dire toute la joie de pouvoir organiser dans ce cadre de partenariat cette troisième conférence sur une thématique toujours aussi importante que les premières. Euh, on dit souvent que, que la première fois c'est un accident, la deuxième fois on ne sait jamais, la troisième c'est une confirmation. Donc là je suis vraiment content qu'on arrive à confirmer ce partenariat euh, et qu'on a toujours ce beau public intéressé euh, par des questions euh, de haute importance. Euh, merci encore et merci à vous tous d'être présents. Merci à M. le professeur qui a accepté d'organiser euh, cette conférence débat aujourd'hui. Euh, Sachez-le, la Fondation de la Maison de Tunisie est une structure de débat euh, ouverte euh, et donc on a tout l'intérêt et tout le plaisir de vous recevoir. Merci, merci pour ce partenariat. Effectivement, pour, pour, pour PSE, c'est aussi un partenariat important. Maybe I switch to English because the rest of the talk will be in English. So thank you for uh, this partnership. When I, when, I, when I tried to prepare, I didn't prepare anything. But when I, when I tried to look at I was thinking, is it the third or the fourth event? And then I realized that asking the question was a good sign that we were already in a long run partnership. And um, so I can already announce the next event to which you are all welcome, which will be the 2nd of May. Branko Milovic will talk about inequalities in the discussion by, uh, introduced by Thomas Piketty. Uh, so please come. Um, that also will be interesting. And uh, with no further delay, I, I, I please ask uh, Martin Revalian and uh, François Bourguignon if you can um, just... Uh, so François will introduce uh, the, the, the subject and then the, the talk will be by Martin Moralia. So again, thank you for the invitation and the partnership and thanks a lot to Martin Moralia to, to, to give his talk and to François for uh, the introduction. So François, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much uh, Pierre-Yves. Uh, welcome to everybody. I don't think that I will uh, really introduce the subject because uh, uh, in that case I would uh, uh, simply be competing with, uh, with Martin on this, so let's uh, wait until uh, he has made the presentation for maybe me to make some observations on the, the presentation. So I would like simply to introduce uh, Martin. Uh, for those uh, of you who might not uh, know him, and uh, I would like first to say that it is a great pleasure to be in that position of introducing him because he's a great friend and he's also a great colleague of uh, whose uh, work I have uh, very much admiration uh, for. So a few words about uh, his uh, career before getting into his uh, production as a development economist working on poverty. Uh, Martin is an Australian citizen. You may guess from his name that he is an Australian citizen from with a French descent. Uh, he studied uh, uh, at the University of Sydney, he got a Bachelor of Science in the University of Sydney. Uh, and as many other economists, Martin didn't really think about becoming an economist initially. And if I remember well, I think that he was considering the possibility of uh, studying or doing something in architecture. And uh, what I know is the way in which uh, he made the turn and suddenly he was in the LSE, London School of Economics, as a graduate student in economics and uh, uh, did his PhD there. He studied with uh, another good friend, a good colleague, and a good friend of the PSC, Tony Atkinson. Uh, then he was a research fellow for a few years in uh, Oxford. Went back to Australia, where he taught in the Australian National University. And then in 1988, he joined the World Bank where uh, he started as a simple researcher and then he made it uh, up the whole hierarchy of uh, positions in research uh, in the bank. Uh, and then uh, uh, he stayed there for 25 years. And uh, uh, this is, I guess, where he has done uh, most of uh, his uh, uh, huge uh, contribution. In uh, 2013, he decided to leave the bank. I must say that we tried at that time to attract him here in the Paris School of Economics. Uh, it almost worked, <coughs> except for the fact that uh, the administrative difficulty of uh, hiring somebody 
uh, in uh, that way, and uh, we could not really uh, find the right format for this kind of uh, recruitment. And I'm afraid that uh, we were competing with Georgetown University, and we lost. Uh, and Martin is now the Edmund Villani Professor of Economics at Georgetown University. Don't make confusion with Cedric Villani, uh, our uh, field winner in mathematics. Okay, so despite uh, uh, all this time in the World Bank, where he had some bureaucratic obligations, and uh, they are quite numerous, uh, what is really astonishing is how much he has been able to produce. Uh, in uh, Martin is among the, uh, the economists the most uh, published and the most cited. I remember there was a ranking some years ago where he appeared uh, in the number five in terms of uh, citation, which is really quite amazing. Uh, I think that we know a lot of people maybe in uh, that uh, ranking, and uh, this is really uh, something uh, outstanding. Uh, of course, in uh, the field of development economics and uh, poverty, and I think that uh, Martin is among the people who tend to consider that development economics and poverty reduction are more or less synonymous, uh, then I don't think that there is anybody who could uh, uh, not know uh, some path-breaking work by, uh, by Martin. So, because this lecture will be on all that contribution, I will say only a few things about uh, uh, his production. I would like to insist on two points. The first point is the fact that his research is definitely academic, but had a huge impact from a policy point of view. And as a matter of fact, a huge impact in the way in which the global community considers uh, poverty and uh, took poverty as a major goal. Uh, in 1990, Martin was uh, the first one to put together also surveys coming from all developing countries which had this kind of household survey, and then using some price indices to make uh, purchasing power comparable, he figured out what was the level of poverty in the world. This, was, uh, uh, this had a lot of uh, uh, success, a lot of uh, uh, impact in the development economics uh, community. And I would say that, I mean, and then the uh, global poverty uh, measurement was invented, and it went on and on, and it's still on today. And I think that uh, we cannot, uh, we cannot uh, ignore the fact that probably this contribution had something to do with the decision by the United Nations Assembly in 2000 to launch the Millennium Development Goals with the first goal, which was the reduction of global poverty. If it had not been possible to measure global poverty, probably this would not have been one of the goals. And uh, I don't think that there are many people who can have this kind of uh, accomplishment uh, behind them. And this is certainly one uh, of the big contribution by Martin. And the second point I would like to say about uh, his work is more about the methodology. Uh, I think that he definitely has an empirical approach to uh, economics of development and of poverty. Uh, but this empirical approach is always grounded on a very solid conceptual uh, uh, and uh, structural uh, basis. And uh, at a time where development economics is more and more about pure empirics, without always this kind of uh, solid conceptual or structural basis, I think that this must be stressed. And uh, I wish that there would be more people following the example of Martin. I've said too much. I could also have uh, uh, gone through all the words and distinctions. I will only mention one, which I learned very recently, as a matter of fact, which is the fact that uh, Martin won this uh, BBVA, BBVA being for Banco de Bilbao y Vizcaya, the big Spanish bank, which is awarding uh, prizes every year in various uh, disciplines for uh, advancement in uh, knowledge. Uh, 
and uh, uh, Martin got uh, the last award which was given by that uh, uh, foundation for uh, development cooperation. And uh, this is certainly a huge uh, award and a very, very significant award. So I will stop here because I don't want to take more time from your presentation, Martin, and you have the floor. Great. Well, thank you very much, Francois. Well, it's a fantastic introduction. Um, and it's great to be at PSC. I guess um, after the World Bank and Georgetown University, there are more people that I thank from PSC in, in this book than anywhere. And um, I thought it very appropriate to have a book launch here. It is a book launch. Uh, I'm a little bit uncomfortable with that because I, I feel like I'm selling this book. And, uh, um, it's a nice book. <laughs> and in fact, Oxford University Press couldn't supply any copies for this event, but they did supply a bunch of vouchers, and there should be enough for everybody, which give you a, gives you a 30% discount. Um, that, I think, works out at about five cents per page. So it's a, a great deal. <laughs> End of sales pitch. Um, what is the book about? I, I, it's, I think it's a bit dull to just go through and um, summarize the book. I won't do that, um, leave you to read it. But um, in a nutshell, what I'm trying to do in this book is um, bring two groups of people together. There are those interested in poverty, and there are those interested in economics. Um, there is an intersection, not a very big intersection. Um, many of those people interested in poverty know very little about economics, and that's actually a problem. And similarly, I think there'd be uh, a great potential for economists to learn about poverty and inequality, but I put poverty as more important here. The task of this book is to expand the intersection, get more people who know about poverty, <coughs> interested in poverty reduction policy, understanding poverty, uh, to teach them economics. And similarly, to teach uh, uh, something about poverty to those who know economics. Um, the idea for the book came entirely from teaching. I had absolutely no intention to write this book when I left the World Bank. Now, as Francois mentioned, and, uh, the research in the World Bank has been very important for, for me and for, for others, and it's influenced me enormously. But um, it's nothing like teaching, particularly teaching undergraduates. Um, it's an amazing <coughs> way of learning about all kinds of things that you thought you understood, but now you've got to explain it. You've got to explain it to undergraduates from first principles. And I introduced this course at Georgetown called Poverty, one word. It is, to my knowledge, the only university-wide course at Georgetown. Uh, about one third of the students are econ majors, but the rest are not. And I'm trying to teach, bring, bring those students, that other two thirds, into economics in a, in a useful way to get them to learn something about but of course, it's a very selected audience. I had 450 students doing this course, and the book was developed for those students. But it morphed into a synthesis of the literature on poverty. I guess that was inevitable. And it, it comes with this objective. I've really got to try and reach these two groups. If you go, th if you go through the book, there's a central text, which is about poverty. Um, I consider it, I think I'm covering all aspects of poverty that I think are important. Um, but along the way, um, you learn the economics. You get that these through boxes as you go through the book. Uh, Ramsey's model of savings. Uh, growth and inequality in credit constrained economy. Um, these are boxes. You can ignore the boxes if you like. If you know the economics, but you want to learn about poverty, you follow the main text. If you want to learn the economics, or you want to brush up on your economics, you go to the boxes as well. Um, I'm going to give you a bit of a quick overview of the book, what's, what it contains, um, but I thought that would be a bit dull, so I thought I'd go a bit beyond the book. What are the challenges ahead, both for research and policy, on this topic? Okay, the tour of the book, 10 chapters, um, history of thought. This was the most fun. Uh, I hadn't really studied history of thought. I did a course with Lionel Robbins at LSE, and um, he was an amazing guy. But um, 
I learned a bit from him, but um, and one of my first my first PhD supervisor before Tony, in fact, before Tony joined LSE was Michio Morishima, and I learned a few things from him. But I, it kind of was a neglected topic, so I had to really go back. And, and one of the things about working for the World Bank is you never have time to read. Uh, if you're lucky, you have time to read something you wrote or somebody else in the World Bank wrote. Uh, it's not quite that bad when you're in research, but. Uh, I still was running out of time to read. So joining Georgetown, I started reading again. And I started reading the history of thought on poverty going back 200 plus years and writing about it. That's the first part of the book. Then we turn to measures and methods, a more familiar terrain for me, um, and systematically going through all the steps in poverty and inequality measurement, or everything you need to know, or, or at least uh, in the basics. Um, measuring welfare, poverty lines, poverty and inequality measures, impact evaluation. And the third part, which is more than a third really, is, is um, about 40%, poverty and policy. Dimensions of poverty and in inequality in the world, growth inequality and poverty, economy-wide policies and sectoral policies, and finally, targeted interventions. Okay, three slides on three parts. Um, really striking thing when you go through the history of thought on, on poverty is that the change that's occurred. And I hadn't realized this. You go back 200 years, the way people talked about poverty in the world was fundamentally different to the way now. There are some overlaps. You still get people today saying things that uh, were mainstream 200 years ago, but they're a minority now. Definitely a minority. A change in view is uh, very clear. Um, in the 18th and 19th century, there was the prevailing view, as uh, I'm confident of this, was a, a really little reason to think that poor people would be, had any chance of being you know, anything else but poor. Um, poverty would inevitably it, it persist. Indeed, a mainstream view coming out of mercantilism from the pre-Adam Smith days, a mainstream view was that poverty was necessary for wealth generation. You had to have poverty for a developing country. Modern view, radically different. Poverty is a social ill, it's something that uh, can be avoided through public action, and doing so is perfectly consistent with a robust growing economy. Understanding that transition, uh, in part one of the book I, I try to explain that transition as best I can, but I readily admit there is a, 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 a lot of the puzzle is not fully, uh, it's a puzzle and we're trying to fit pieces together and the historical record is never complete. <laughs> Attention to poverty and inequality. Uh, there's one little link that I've got here. Let's see if I can get it going. There we go. Um, anybody here heard of the Google Ingram Viewer? No? My goodness. Okay, well. Um, let's see if we can get it coming up. Um, well, and I'm very sorry for you because um, you've just heard about it and you're probably going to waste a lot of time now, <laughs> as I have. Um, this is an amazing thing that allows you to read digitized text really quickly. Um, 10 million books have been digitized and good by Google. I hate to be advertising Google, but it's a fantastic thing. So here, um, the, on the vertical axis here is the percentage of all words in the English language, digitized words in, uh, in the English language, this is books, reports, anything that could be digitized. Percentage of all words, which are the word poverty. And here we have the same, the red line is the same thing for inequality. Um, you could do it for, in French too. In French it looks very similar. Uh, the difference is that the inequality <coughs> line in French is way higher, inegality. But um, in French as well as English, you've got these two marked points. The peak, the current, the peak of, of the incidence of the word poverty in both English and French is now. There was a first peak, though, which was in the latter part of the 18th century. And I call this the, the first poverty enlightenment. And I call this peak here the second poverty enlightenment. I'm not identifying those things from the Google Ingram Viewer. I'm identifying it from the literature. And one of the great things about the Google Ingram Viewer is you can click on any year and you can find all of the text 
that that count is based on. That's actually quite important because you've got to figure out whether the word you're using has changed its meaning. Uh, the word poverty, I argue, has not changed its meaning. There are a couple of other words that were you once used, that like indigence in English, which have fallen uh, by the wayside. Um, but you can go and check to see whether the word has changed its meaning. But um, you can actually see what people were saying, and, and you can get how one one angle, you, you one tool, very useful tool for getting out this history of thought on on the topic. Okay. I also learned and record a bit in the, in the book that this process of change from the um, original view, 18th and early 19th century, where it was dominant, the modern view, uh, the transition um, had uh, important episodes and periods. The late, um, late 19th century, early 20th century is hugely important in many respects, including in policy. Uh, but um, you also I also learned that in that transition, there's a lot of struggle. A lot of people, individuals and groups, gave up their liberty or, work or more of their lives in that struggle for that transition. And it was primarily a struggle about introducing a certain class of anti-poverty policies, what I call promotional policies. You can think of anti-poverty policies as two things, protection and promotion. It's a distinction due to Jean Dres and Amartya Sen. Um, that distinction is quite powerful. Um, if you go back historically, ancient times in, in, in both the East and the West, uh, Asia and India and China, the, we see uh, a lot of discussion of protection, the role of, of anti-poverty policy is to protect people from shocks, downside risk, and that is, goes back thousands of years. The idea of, of promotion, the idea of anti-poverty policy is to get people out of poverty, out of poverty traps, or if they're not in poverty traps, to raise their productivity, that's the modern view. And that's what the struggle was about. It was things like introducing compulsory schooling or mass schooling. That was a struggle in places like England. It took 100 years. And the struggle is fascinating. It, 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 we saw industrialists fighting against schooling. Uh, in the early uh, 19th century in England, a working class kid would start school at the age of seven. Industrialists were worried that uh, mass schooling would imply higher wage rates and so on. The struggle went on uh, in many areas. The labor movement, the civil rights movement, particularly in the second poverty enlightenment in the 1960s, the civil rights movement in the US was hugely important to progressive social policy changes. And so were the writings of many people, journalists, people like Michael Harrington, writing about poverty in America hugely influential. In Michael Harrington's book, The Other America, uh, first appeared. The print run was 2,000 copies. Within 10 years, it was up to around 1.3 million copies. It was a big surprise. And what did Michael Harrington do? He described poverty in, in America. Uh, and people were shocked. They were shamed. That has happened. That observation has happened repeatedly. Charles Booth writing about poverty in London in the 1890s. He shocked Londoners. Um, he showed one third of Londoners lived below this level of living, and, and they were shamed by it. Within <coughs> 10 years, we had policy responses, including the, the beginning uh, of the welfare state in, in Britain, and the introduction of things like pensions. Debates continue, but I believe today, and the book argues, and, and many people are, other also argue, that we are now at a point where a social consensus around eliminating extreme poverty is within reach. I do not believe we are we're near a consensus on inequality of the same order of magnitude as we have with poverty. I hope we reach that consensus on inequality. It's going to be harder, I believe, but we have reached the consensus, I believe, on poverty. Okay, second part, measures and methods. Uh, the book... Um, goes through the data issues, it, uh, all of the issues on price indices, household surveys, sampling. It introduces these issues for a, for a broad audience and tries to introduce a, a few more technical points as well that may be uh, not familiar even to some people who, who, who study this. Um, 
But most importantly, the, the book emphasizes the conceptual issues in measurement. Repeatedly, when you look at measurement issues, you see that uh, the theoretical or conceptual issue underlying the measurement is crucial to understanding what you're measuring and to drawing the right inferences from that measure. And the book sees that, points to that in many ways. Uh, the distinction between absolute and relative poverty, an old distinction. And the book argues, uh, uh, I think many economists would probably agree with me on this, but the book argues that poverty is only absolute in the space of welfare. But that means that it's inevitably going to be relative in the space of commodities. That's almost word for word uh, a statement made by Amartya Sen in a paper in 1983. Um, absolute in the space of welfare means that we're welfare consistent. We respect the Pareto, pre -Pareto principle. We, we judge people at the same level of welfare the same way. If by our judgment of welfare, whatever judgment that is, and we have to be explicit about that, by, if by that judgment I deem that two people have the same level of welfare, then they're either both of them are poor or both of them are not poor. And we, can, we, we take it further to, to in our comparisons of their level of welfare. But if people also care about relative deprivation, as we've learned that they, they almost certainly do, uh, there are social inclusion needs, there are concerns about relative deprivation in society, then there's an argument that can be brought in to, to say that uh, poverty is also relative in the space of commodities. Another distinction, absolute versus relative inequality. Um, I found that a lot of the debates about anti-poverty policy, the debates that are reviewed particularly in chapter eight of the book, this distinction was, was, was evident. But it's a distinction that hasn't been made clear. It's, it's a distinction that inequality experts understand. It's a difference in two axioms, or two rival axioms of inequality measurement. Uh, one's called scale independence, and one's called translation independence, or translation invariance. But what, I, what people don't realize is how significant that is to debates about poverty and inequality in the world. The globalization debate, I argue, is in, is in part, not entirely, but in part, a debate over the concept of inequality one is using. One side of this debate is thinking of inequality as absolute. It's about the absolute differences between the levels of living of rich and poor people. And the other is arguing that inequality is relative. It's about the relative it's about your, your, the ratios of incomes, your income relative to somebody else's, as a ratio rather than a difference. A very simple conceptual difference. But if you don't understand this difference, you don't understand the debate. And I argue in the book that both sides of this debate are often passing each other in the night. They're not seeing their position because they don't understand the difference in their concepts. Um, I do in my, my Georgetown undergraduate course, I, I give each class a, I've done three times now, I've been 450 students. I give them the, the, uh, a little quiz. I show them the, 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 a bunch of numbers, they all do it independently. And out of these, the comparisons of these stylized distributions, I can figure out whether they're absolutists or relativists. Whether they think about inequality as absolute inequality or relative inequality. Half of my students, repeatedly half of them, think of inequality in absolute terms, half think of inequality in relative terms. It's not that one's right and one's wrong. There's no penalty from this to being a, an absolutist. And I, I'm a relativist. Many people are, are, are absolutists. Um, my partner, Dominique van der Waal, she's an absolutist, and we get along fine. Um, it's not a problem. But it is a problem if you want to understand this debate. And that is, I think, really important. Um, social subjective poverty lines, relevance to what uh, uh, um, poverty means in a society. The book argues that basically the only legitimate way of thinking about a poverty line is as a social subjective poverty line. A poverty line is the point above which people in a specific society tend to think they are not poor and below which people tend to think they're poor. It's socially specific. And that's actually quite well defined. There are measurement methods. Um, a school of economics and started in Holland with uh, Bernard van Praag and uh, other students of van Praag, like Gary Capte. And it's been developed in economics. My work and others have developed tools for implementing that idea empirically. And it's, it's, it, I believe it actually you can do it in quite scientific way uh, to find that social subjective poverty line. It's a fixed point in the relationship between your personal perception of what poverty means and your actual circumstances in society. 
you find that fixed point and you found this magic number above which on average people tend to think they're not poor and below which they tend to think they're poor. Getting that traction, getting that into statistics offices all over the world is a continuing challenge, but we're starting to see some take up. Um, I also argue in the book that objective poverty lines are actually ways of finding the social subjective poverty line. What's called an objective poverty line, using a, a bundle of goods, specific pricing those goods and so on, is actually a, a way, maybe a rather clumsy way, of finding the social subjective poverty. Because what you're trying to do is find a poverty line that people will accept in the society. It's no good a statistics office producing a poverty line that nobody accepts. They look at this line and they say, yeah, but that's ridiculous. That's either too high or too low. What, they're trying, what you're trying to do with objective poverty measurement, what statistics offices are trying to do all over the world, is I argue, in a somewhat clumsy way, they're trying to find the social subjective poverty line. They're trying to find that magic number. That will, why? Because that will have traction. That will be accepted in society. It'll, it'll be the line that has the least, or is the line of least resistance, if you like, in the specific society. Part three on policies. Um, Unfortunately, I, I've tried, I've been trying for 30 years, but I still can't find a magic bullet for poverty reduction. I find in some societies anything you do will work, in other societies anything you do will fail. Context is hugely important. So the book takes the view that, uh, not predictably for an economist and someone academic economist, it takes the view that it's really about how you think about policy. It's about the principles, it's about thinking of objectives and constraints, formulating it in a very careful way, and the constraints are many, including uh, the <coughs> traditional incentive constraints. I'm just going to highlight a few aspects of the, the approach to policy. The book talks about a lot of specific policies. It talks about the evidence <laughs> for and against, and that, can, and that contextuality comes out very clearly. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of research still to do. The picture is very incomplete. Separation. Um, the book takes the view, and um, I think it's a, a main, reasonably mainstream view in economics now, that, that strict separation between policy instruments and objectives is not a really good way to approach this topic. A certain amount of, or for as an organizing theme, a certain amount of separation is convenient, but that, the implication for, of going, taking it too far is that you miss a lot of important stuff, particularly about the distributional implications of economy-wide and sectoral policy. So the book argues it is a mistake to think about anti-poverty policies as direct interventions. That's deliberately why chapter 10 is the last chapter, the chapter that deals with direct interventions, targeted, it's what you might call social assistance, targeted um, anti-poverty policies. They're important, hugely important, but there's a whole lot of other stuff that is arguably more important in terms of policy, more important to what happens inequality and poverty in society. The book also takes a, a strong view on targeting. Um, I think this has become a fetish. Uh, one of the many debates I lost at the World Bank, and I'm still struggling with it, um, both the fact that I lost the debate and the fact that it's actually important. Um, targeting is not an objective of, 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 so of anti-poverty policy. Targeting is sometimes useful, sometimes not. I'm increasingly coming to the view that in poor countries, we should be talking about much more universal schemes. I was in Sweden yesterday giving a, a lecture, and uh, I'm learning a bit about Swedish economic history too. Um, I think it's striking how Sweden started with universal programs. As its administrative capabilities developed, it, 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 it got to more targeted programs. But what we're currently doing is telling poor countries all over the world, we, the development community, the donors, the advisors, are telling very poor countries to tie, finally target their programs. They don't have the administrative capability often to do that. One of the things about being a poor place is that you have poor administrative capability. It's hard to do stuff. Skilled labor is scarce, for, for, for example. Um, so targeting can't be seen as the objective here. It is an instrument that is sometimes useful, sometimes not, and, and that position is taken in the book. Um, it also talks a bit about horizontal versus vertical inequality. Aspects of distribution, I think, are often missing. Again, they're understood by um, the frontiers of knowledge, but they're not understood very well 
in policy. And that's crucial because if you just think about inequality as the vertical dimensions, rich versus poor, and you ignore the inequalities generated horizontally, if, for example, in a trade reform, if you implement a trade reform, you're going to have diverse net trading positions at a given level of welfare, a given level of, of income, or, or however you, how you measure welfare. That diversity in net trading positions will mean you have gainers and losers amongst the poor. Amongst the poor. If you're doing a, a food price intervention, a food price liberalization, you're going to see rising food prices. Some poor people benefit, some poor people lose. Recognizing that horizontal dimension is, is key to good policy making. It doesn't mean that the horizontal dimension is going to override your assessment ac across the entire distribution, but you have to be aware of it to form policy. The book talks a lot about incentive effects, but takes the view that, well, first, you can't ignore them. Incentives, no way. I mean, you know, I guess this is predictable. Scratching the climate get an incentive argument. You know, it's, it's important. But the history of thought about poverty teaches us that you can exaggerate incentive arguments, and I think that has often been the case. One of the greatest economists of the early 19th century, possibly the greatest economist, was uh, David Ricardo. He's also one of the greatest exaggerators of all time. He exaggerated incentive effects and his arguments against the old poor laws, uh, which, uh, along with Malthus, led to fundamental changes in English uh, anti-poverty policy, the introduction of new poor laws, much more finely targeted, and a lot of social reaction to that, a lot of criticism. People like Dickens, uh, Florence Nightingale, um, Benjamin Disraeli uh, were, 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 were staunchly, staunch critics of that position. Um, but essentially it was an argument about incentive effects, adverse effects on work effort, labor supply and savings of, of, of anti-poverty policy. Uh, Ricardo's exaggeration was possible at the time because he didn't have any data. He couldn't estimate labor supply functions. He couldn't tell us what the response of, of labor supply is to, to income changes and so on. We can now do that, so have much more informed discussion of the importance of incentives. A lot of great work that's been done on this and some good surveys on it, people, work of people like Bob Moffat and um, Emmanuel Says and others, uh, particularly in developed countries, particularly in the U.S., uh, which has shown that incentive effects are there, but they're, they're, they've been exaggerated. Now, important area for research here, I also think we need much more work on incentive effects in developing countries. I, I think the literature is not very compelling, particularly in situations where there are large informal sectors. Uh, it creates an, a margin for incentive effects that is probably less important in rich countries. And that, so I put that caveat up there. I think we don't know enough about incentive effects in that context. But I generally take the view that we have to consider them, but put it this way, that there are other constraints that are possibly more important, which we need to also give attention to. And they're, they're not quite as, as sexy to an economist as incentive effects, but they're really important. Information, administrative capabilities in particular societies, and political economy. I think they stand out as hugely important constraints on anti-poverty policy, which we do have to understand. And the book argues that effective policy must recognize those constraints, particularly on administrative capabilities. No good introducing a complex anti-poverty program in a situation where the capabilities to implement it are not there. The implication, the outcome of that is just going to be what we see. Corruption on the anti-poverty program. Corruption arises because of weak states. Weak states meaning states that can't, don't have the capability to, to, to um, effectively implement the policy as intended. The book also points to many examples in which what is written in paper about a policy is not what is actually happening on the ground. When you imagine you have powers, administrative capabilities that you don't in fact have, and you implement an anti-poverty policy, one thing that's going to happen, well, when it hits the ground, things are going to look very different. Because they'll be trying to implement something that they can't implement, so it's going to turn into a different policy. We see that repeatedly. Policies that are on paper are poverty traps. In reality, the exact opposite. The direct marginal tax rate is not 100% on the policy. The marginal tax rate is more like 15 20%. It's probably too low rather than being too high. A marginal tax rate of 100% is a poverty trap created by a policy. And the poverty traps exist in anti-poverty policy as well as in uh, due to markets. But, um, whether they're actually happening in reality is another issue. 
Oh, and finally, evaluation. Here the book takes the view, there's one chapter devoted to the methods of evaluation, but the, the lessons from evaluation permeate the book, especially in chapter 10, where we, we've learned a lot about the, the impact of the specific interventions. Okay, challenges ahead. Um, I'll just flag a few things. Huge progress against poverty, there's no doubt about that, but at least progress against absolute poverty. Uh, drawing on, on, on work of uh, Francois Bouillon, Christian Morrison, um, who kindly provided me their, their data as well, or I provided them some data, and we, we provided, they gave me back some data, and I tried to put the picture together uh, of how the current, the rich world today, how did it escape absolute poverty? And that's an important lesson for development economists. You go back 200 years, Western Europe, this country, it was as, as poor as Sub-Saharan Africa is today, by any measure that we can, can credibly construct. The data is not ideal, of course, but that seems to be the case. Even in, in the United States, the poverty rate in 1820 was about the same as Sub-Saharan Africa in 1990, actually higher than Sub-Saharan Africa now. And, and you know, there, there are difficult data problems here, but uh, I'm reasonably confident of that. So really the difference is, 1820 we had 1 billion people absolutely poor, and in, in 2000, 2010 we had 1 billion people absolutely poor. The difference is that in 1820 there were 80% of the world's population, whereas now there are less than 20% of the world's population. That's the nature of our progress. Importantly, also since the new millennium, since 2000, we are seeing declining numbers of absolutely poor people in all regions of the world. For a while it was largely driven by China, and India, but primarily China. But now we're seeing a broader participation in that process of absolute poverty reduction. And it's coming with important progress in non-income dimensions of poverty, which the book uh, talks about. Um, but there are also some troubling aspects under the surface. In a sense, absolute, extreme absolute poverty is the one thing we're doing really well in the sort of poverty, in the map of poverty measures that we can talk about. A lot of other things we're not doing so well. Uh, decided lack of progress, I argue, in raising the consumption level of, of the level of the floor, the lowest level of living in the world. That has risen in the last 30 years, but only modestly. About 0.4% per annum versus about 2.4% per annum for me overall mean consumption. In a way, what we're doing is we're, we're, there are fewer people living near the floor the lowest level of living. The, f the floor is basically at the biological level, about 67 cents a day at 2005 prices. There are fewer people living near there, but the level of the floor has not risen. And it's going to be harder and harder, I suspect, to reach people at the floor, but it is an important objective in society. We see that all the time. Social policies in rich countries and poor countries talk explicitly about leave no one behind, raise the floor. Minimum levels of living in society are desirable. So our failure, our relative failure in raising the floor is important. Also interestingly, the rich world, when it escaped that extreme poverty, as I just mentioned, the rich world raised the floor faster than the developing world did. And I believe the reason for that is the rich world had more effective administrative capability for implementing better social policies at a time when it was equally poor as the poor world is today on average. So again, that point about administrative capability comes in clearly. Uh, that's a bit of a conjecture, but something I, I, I hope to research more. Um, also ambiguity on the impacts of, it, of growth and uh, the absolute poverty reduction on inequality. Um, about half the time in growing kind of developing countries, we're seeing relative inequality rise, and about half the time it's falling. Absolute inequality is rising almost everywhere in growing developing countries. That's not hugely surprising, but it's, again, it's important to, to realize that's happening. If you do think about inequality in absolute terms, as I said, half my students and quite possibly half, the, half of the, the, the population of the world think about inequality in absolute terms, it's a perfectly defensible concept. But if you do think about inequality in those terms, you are going to see a marked trade-off between poverty reduction and inequality reduction. And you have to recognize that point. If you really want to fight absolute poverty, you're going to live in a poorer world. This is the numbers on relative and absolute poverty. That, um, I can update these in a couple of years now, but um, um, I haven't done it. It looks basically the same. Here we have 
the, the numbers of people uh, back 30 years living below $1.25 a day at 2005 prices, or $1.90 a day at 2011. Um, numbers are absolutely poor, and that's the progress I was talking about before, right, over, the, over the last 30 years. And you can take this back uh, to 1820, it gets really hard and harder because of the data. Um, Francois and, and when Francois and, and Christian Morrison wrote that paper, I was mildly appalled, actually, because of their, their heroism to have constructed measures back to 1820. And I'm now reproducing them, and I'm a bit more confident in, in them, but as somebody like me, when you go back to 1980, I get worried about the quality of my data. Um, but I think we you know, put it all together, I think we're reasonably confident about the long-term picture. Precise numbers are unclear. And, and I think um, we're reasonably confident on, on numbers up to uh, after the 19, early 1980s. And this is the picture we see. Uh, the striking thing here is that we're seeing this decline in absolute poverty, but we're seeing this rising numbers of relatively poor. What do I mean by relatively poor? I mean that uh, the, the group of people in this area uh, are, are no longer, they're living above a global international line, $1.25 a day, but they're still poor by the standards of the country they live in. They're not kind of globally poor by that international standard, but they're poor by the standard of the country they live in. And that's an important distinction. And I think we're going to bring that, uh, sociologists use the word I quite like, social inclusion, social exclusion. Bringing that concept into our uh, discussions of poverty in poor countries is important in my, in my view. Uh, the book argues there are two paths going forward, a um, pessimistic path, path, an optimistic path for progress against poverty. The pessimistic path um, basically is, is the status quo and growth trajectories prior to 2000 um, and the trajectories we saw on inequality prior to 2000. Going back to that path, it's going to take 50 years to lift 1 billion people out of poverty. The optimistic path says essentially that the growth rates we've seen in, 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 the, in the developing world since 2000, those are maintained without an increase in overall inequality. There may be increases in inequality in specific countries and so on, but overall inequality in, in the developing world is kept at a, a, a current levels. That path, and that is optimistic, maintaining those growth rates, there are going to be a lot of threats to that, crises, risks, and so on, um, and putting a lid on the rise in overall inequality won't be um, easy by any means. The optimistic path will lift one billion people out of extreme poverty by 2030. And that became the first of the sustainable development goals, is to get onto that optimistic path. Policy challenges going, uh, challenges going forward, I'll just highlight three quickly. Inequality and risk, I think this is, um, um, this is not there, this is not, this is not a complete list of challenges, but certainly one of them. Um, here we have a lot of concerns, a riskier world, and, but also a world in which social protection policies have proven poor at dealing with risk. Social protection policies in developing countries are too sticky, they're too inflexible, they don't adjust enough to changing circumstances. Um, and that's a challenge going forward. Um, the book also argues that to make progress on the other agenda here, getting the social consensus on inequality, to make progress on that agenda, we're going to have to unpack this concept of inequality. It's also important to make progress on that agenda from the point of view of poverty reduction, as I already emphasized. Putting a lid on overall inequality is going to be crucial. But if you're just focusing on inequality reduction, I think it's, it's going to be really crucial to get that social consensus similarly to poverty. The book argues you're not going to get it using the word inequality without a lot of more precision about what you mean about inequality. What specific dimensions? And the book flags a number of issues where I think we could achieve a consensus. Early childhood development, we've learnt a lot about the inequalities in human development, how they persist, that poor kids growing up uh, poor, early years of life can perpetuate, uh, circumstances in the early years of life Perpetuate, can be perpetuated through schooling periods and aren't eliminated. Those disadvantages aren't eliminated by the schooling process. And the lessons that are coming out of from a number of sources on that are compelling. 
uh, that emphasizes the inequalities in schooling and healthcare, access to land, and of course, gender inequalities, which are pervasive and a lot to be done there. Second challenge on urbanization and migration. Repeatedly, we're still seeing poor people trapped. They're trapped between the policies that tax agriculture explicitly or implicitly, underinvest in, in agriculture and rural development. At the same time, the same country is also making it harder for rural people to move to urban areas and similarly have international migration restrictions. Both these sources of, uh, of restrictions are, imped are impediments to poor people realizing the opportunities for urbanization. You've got a, one of the great, one of the lessons of China's success is the sequencing of reform, the importance of starting in agriculture and rural development in the reform process, and China's achieved a greater, greater poverty reduction in any country in human history. That lesson is, is so important to, throughout the developing world today, throughout many low-income countries, not just in sub-Saharan <coughs> Africa, but certainly many in sub-Saharan Africa, have not learned that lesson, um, the importance of investing in agriculture initially as a pro part of the process of people moving out of agriculture. There's a, there's a dualism there that has to be understood in development policy much better. Instead, we see all kinds of impediments to realizing those, those opportunities, distorted urban labor markets, captured urban planning, urban planning processes that are captured by um, uh, the incumbents um, and at the expense of poor people, policy biases in taxation and public spending, explicit or implicit restrictions on migration. A first order policy reform for a poverty reduction in the world today is for China to remove the hukou system the registration system that is impeding progress against poverty there. And of course, when it's a policy reform in a country like China, it's first order globally as well. Restrictions on migration, um, as I mentioned, urban policies that undersupply services to poor people is a chronic problem. Finally, on relative poverty, how are we going to make progress there? Um, here, I'm, the challenge is even greater. Uh, one of the sustainable development goals is to halve what I call relative poverty, uh, by 2030. That, that, uh, they didn't ask me about that halving. Um, that's going to be really difficult. I think achieving the very first sustainable development goal of, uh, of uh, getting the poverty rate down to 3%, that's lifting 1 billion people out of extreme poverty. Uh, that is believable in a sense. I call it an optimistic path that would get you there, but I can see a, a sequence of things that could, could get us there. The type of change in redistributive policy that would be needed to halve the relative poverty rate by that by 2030, that's going to be a big challenge. It will require a major effort in redistribution, which I'm, I, I, well, I hope, but um, you've got to realize it's going to be, there's going to be a struggle there. Okay, more material on the book. Um, there's a website I've created, uh, economicsandpoverty.com which gives you a lot of extra stuff, extra material, uh, links to all kinds of things that I don't put in the book. For example, in the Econ 156, the, the poverty course, we spend a lot of time talking about poverty in the media. Uh, every second lecture, we, we talk about something from the news, and there's a ton of stuff that, uh, it's a good way of bringing students into it. They like to be studying something that's actually current, and demonstrating that is, is, is valuable. Um, thank you for your attention. Looking forward to your comments and questions.